somebody who's got a clear conflict of interest, the guy who's running for office, who's running the credentialing, that's a clear conflict of interest and you can't tell people they can't register. This is shady. Fuck you! Fuck you! My name is Michael Heiss. I am the founder and chair of the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and Mises PAC. Why did you start the Mises Caucus in the first place? What is the, like the events leading up to that or the reasoning within yourself that you thought, all right, this is something that I have to do? It was just a collection of experience and observations over the course of several years. Uh, I, I, my involvement in libertarianism and the liberty movement, uh, I'm a product of the Ron Paul revolution. Uh, and that experience was very high energy, very electric, uh, very unifying, and uh, very effective as well. Um, and by the time 2015 came around, I was involved in the Libertarian Party, supported Gary Johnson, and the experience of the Gary Johnson campaign as opposed to the Ron Paul revolution was just like a night and day experience. The Gary Johnson campaign was much more low energy, a lot less passion, a lot less resources, a lot less people knowing what they're doing. Uh, it was just missing the spirit that characterized the, the Ron Paul revolution. So in the aftermath of the, the Gary Johnson campaign, I, I started conceptualizing the idea of the Mises Caucus as a means of bringing the Liberty Movement and the Ron Paul revolution into the party to kind of get that spirit back. Well, I've been friends with Michael Heiss since before the caucus was formed. He actually called me to tell me about the caucus, and I basically laughed at him and told him I, I don't really do the caucus thing. Um, I like to do my own thing and just work with everybody and don't want to be labeled as part of a group. And I guess it was in 2020, I was running for state representative, and I had a really good opportunity there to, to win a lot of votes in my district. Um, it was very hard to get on the ballot with the pandemic and stuff, and the state party was basically MIA the whole time. Everything, they couldn't even get out a press release or a Facebook post about my campaign for me. And Michael Heiss and Jeff Douglas and all the people from the Mises Caucus came from all ends of the state to make sure I got on the ballot, came and worked the polls for me, sent me volunteers for phone banking. Um, Every bit of volunteer and support I got from my campaign almost came from the Mises Caucus exclusively. And that wasn't because I was a caucus member or anything. That's because they were my friends and I was a good candidate. I knew Mike, uh, you know, since I got involved in Monco in 2017, um, we've been friends ever since. Um, he actually never even asked me to be part of the caucus, surprisingly. It was just this past year or so that I actually went to him and said, hey, how can I get more involved? Uh, so even though him and I knew each other all this time, it's not like he was pressuring me. You know, uh, I'm the one that saw the line in the sand and you know how that before I didn't really feel I needed to be part of a caucus and thought we were all libertarians and all friends and all on the same side, but I started to see the more radical and bold side and the side that just want to, you know, kind of toe the line and run candidates and that's it. We're still in very good shape nationally. If they lose here, it's over nationally because we already have the majority in California, we already have the majority in Florida. That's one, three. This is number four. We've already taken Nevada, we've already taken Kentucky, we've already taken New Hampshire, we've already taken uh, uh, West Virginia, we're about to take Delaware. We were already 60% of the delegation last year, and, and uh, our candidate this year is actually from California, has way deeper roots. The opposition was there from literally day one. I mean, um, I had been, on social media, I had been kind of kicking around the idea of the Mises Caucus uh, and bringing the movement into the party and this kind of thing for months, but I hadn't actually like committed to it. Uh, and then the day that I made the Facebook group, literally hours later, the chair of the party at that time, uh, Nick Sarwark, had said that the Mises Institute was the preferred think tank of Nazis. Um, and when you've got that kind of thing coming from the chair of the national party, 
it kind of works its way down and sets the tone and sets the standard. So that's exactly what happened and it just escalated from there. So now everybody that was supportive of the chair or more broadly supportive of the kind of vision that that chair had, which is, I would say, still characterizes the majority of leadership today, uh, has kind of taken that tone and protected people that take that tone with us. I mean, what, in your opinion, is that, like, where is that coming from? What's the At basis? that point, I don't actually think that we, the caucus, were the inspiration. Um, we are now, <laughs> because we've become a real force inside the party. But um, that chair, Nicholas Sarwark, he had expressly said that his goal was to take the party to the left. Um, and the Mises Institute, Ron Paul, all, you know, Judge Knapp, all these guys that are associated with the Mises too in that sphere of libertarianism. Um, most of them are more personally conservative, more personally traditional and all that kind of thing. So um, I think it was an effort for, of, of Sarwark to kind of cement the deal and start cutting off the party from the more right oriented or, or uh, conservative oriented libertarians as a part of this move to take the party to the left as the identity politics and the woke politics and all that stuff started to rise in the country. I don't follow a lot of what goes on nationally. And it seemed like a lot of the blowback to the caucus was nationally when it first started. And then it kind of spilled over into this state somewhere towards the end of 2019 with the uh, Maj Torre campaign. And the funny part is I remember the convention before Maj's campaign and they were searching Maj Torre around for city council in Philadelphia. And that 2019 state convention, everybody was like, we got to run a good city council candidate in Philadelphia. And that, that was a lot of the talk at that convention. So then Michael Heiss shows up and says, I'm friends with Maj Torre. Why don't we see if he could run? And everybody's like, oh my God, that would be amazing if Maj runs for city council. Mike, Mike's like, I'll make the phone call. So the last day of the convention, Mike announces that Maj is going to run for city council. And Michael Heiss was like the hero of that day. I mean, they almost paraded him around the room on their shoulders. They were so excited that Maj Torre was going to run for city council in Philadelphia, and Mike made it all happen. Fast forward through his campaign and towards the end of his campaign, People running his campaign trusted not so trustworthy people. A lot of shady things went on. People were unhappy about this thing or the other thing. The campaign wasn't this grand success that everybody thought it was. In my mind, I thought the campaign was a success because Maj brought the libertarian message to the streets of Philadelphia. I think that freedom of speech, you know, um, the ability to say whatever you want, even if it's vile, even if you disagree, even if I disagree with it, I'm always going to defend somebody's uh, ability to make themselves look like a fool in a free space. I don't measure success of campaigns by how many votes you got, but how many people you've reached with the message. And I thought Maj did an incredible job re reaching people with this message. But a lot of people in the party went full-blown attack on Maj and anybody that supported him after his campaign. Mike, being the loyal person he is, stood up for his friend and the campaign he worked on. And then the attacks immediately left Maj, went to Michael Heiss. And next thing you know, Michael Heiss was enemy number one of the state party in Pennsylvania. I would say um, it's all about losing control. If, if you had a social club that you, uh, you, know, you were the cool kid in, would you be okay with a thousand more people coming in that social club and you becoming irrelevant? I, I don't think so. You know, so this is more so just um, pushback against that. You know, us as libertarians and us as people in the Mises Caucus, we want to grow the party by bringing these small L libertarians um, into the actual libertarian party. And that's going to grow astronomically. So the state party has what's called the convention committee. Uh, and that committee is tasked with organizing all the different aspects of the convention from the business to the extracurricular, to the speakers, everything. Um, and I was in contact with one of the members of that committee, Mark Bizzacco, who was also a candidate for uh, state chair. 
and uh, he had come to me and asked me if I had any leads on any speakers because uh, the state party had a, a small budget for their speakers, and but they also wanted to bring people out that would draw a crowd and, and boost membership. So uh, I was happy to work with him and help. and. Uh, we have support of a number of people with a large audience within the liberty movement. So I was happy to, to kind of leverage that. Before long, I had gotten interest of like Dave Smith, uh, Scott Horton, and Michael Rechtenwald, who was local to Pittsburgh where the convention was happening. So I submitted those to Mark, and he took it to the convention committee. Ultimately, what I was told is that uh, they did not want Dave that he was quote unquote divisive uh, and that he would he would uh, chase more people out than he would bring in and that they didn't want Michael Rechtenwald for similar reasons. Uh, they, they said they would take Scott, um, but I had told Scott and I had told Mark that that's not how this is going to work. I mean, Scott is very good friends with Dave. You know, we're not gonna offer you these AAA speakers and, and you basically disrespect two of them and then just pick the one that you want. And it was also politically motivated. I mean, they'll never admit it, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that they know that Dave in particular would draw a crowd of people and, and get them to become members. And that the type of people that he might draw in to become members isn't going to vote for leadership the way that they wanted people to vote. Uh, and so I, I think that was the majority reason why they actually didn't want Dave. There was no working with the party at the convention to get these speakers on yeah, the no. stage, right? No. Yeah, they, and, and that's why the decision was made eventually to create our own event. It's like, we're doing everything we can for you. We're trying to pay for these speakers. We're trying to boost the turnout. We're trying to recruit members, which is the same thing as bringing money into the party. And then you're basically just gonna slap us in the face and say, oh, well, we might lose, so we don't care about the interests of the party if it means we might lose. So from there, I just said, oh, well, if you don't want our speakers, that's fine, but we have our own resources. We have our own audience, and we, we can platform whoever we want, so we're just gonna do our own event. Hey, I'm a Toastmaster, I can handle this. <laughs> First of all, I have to thank the Mises Caucus for inviting me to speak to you today. And it's great for you people to come out here and spend your time for liberty. We, we gotta make that a habit here in Pennsylvania. We, we're gonna need a bigger room next year though. My name is Mark Bizzacco and I'm running to be the chair of the Libertarian Party of Pennsylvania. <laughs> if we don't have taxes, who will build the roads? She actually said that. I always thought that was just a Facebook joke. It's real. They actually say that stuff. Uh, most of us get our news from TV. And on TV, they never explain. They never say, here's who's who, here's who's occupying who. Here's a little bit of background about what's going on. Because as Ron Paul talked a lot about, libertarians are uniquely positioned to work on coalitions, single issue coalitions with both the left and the right where nobody has to give up their principles. Stop lying about us and tell the truth and then let's have an honest conversation about where our differences are, okay? Let me just state this for the record. This is who we are. We are the Ron Paul Army. The Mises Caucus candidates took all seven positions on the board. I had no idea I was being invited to a historic event. He's like, face painter called out sick. I need you to fill in. I'm like, I can't draw, but how hard is it to draw dicks and look at spaces for a few hours? Give me that hard, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here. This is my hometown. I'm actually a Pittsburgher. I have that in common with Ron Paul. And as Pennsylvanians, we have a strong precedent in our history for not cooperating with federal laws that violate the fundamental right of human beings. The concept, the notion of a political party rooted in Misesian thought, you know, real liberalism and real economics, I, I got to admit, that has a, a lot of appeal. That has a lot of appeal, and that would be a hell of a thing if it could be done. In the midst of, of 
the Second World War, George Orwell says, you know, all these words that people throw around, like fascism has just become a word to sort of connote loosely things we don't like. And democracy or democratic, that's sort of become a catch-all term for things that are good and things that we do like. And that is so damn true today. When you're faced with somebody who's got a clear conflict of interest, the guy who's running for office, who's running the credentialing, that's a clear conflict of interest, and you can't tell people they can't register. This is shady. So the credentialing process for the convention is where people who registered for the convention basically confirm who they are, confirm that they are a member or not in good standing, and therefore confirm that they are eligible to vote so that they can uh, decide quorum and, and all of that kind of thing for the business itself. Um, so the first thing that I encountered was, you know, I was in line, I got myself credentialed, but then I started getting reports from Mises members saying that they just were not being allowed to credential. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're saying, oh, well, they, they can't tell that I'm a registered libertarian. So there's two rules in place uh, that you have to get over in order to become a, a, a voter at the convention. One is you have to be a registered libertarian. So like your voter registration, you have to be registered libertarian. And you also have to be a dues paying member. Um, now, if you wanna clear the rule, you have to be a dues paying member for 180 days. But historically, if you're a dues paying member and you're registered, that vote or that rule gets waived and everybody has been allowed to vote. But uh, the, what I ran into that morning was people saying, well, no, I have been a 180 day uh, member and I'm a registered libertarian, but they're saying that I'm not registered. They're saying that in the database that they are not registered libertarians, yeah. even though they are, have emails from the state yeah. showing that they registered libertarian. Yeah. Now, it's part, part of it is because we have a primary election and there's like a cutoff date with the primary election. So they are now trying to apply that to the party when that detail is not in the bylaw. Um, so I had to go onto that computer and type in my give, type in my name or my driver's license number and it shows up with um, my registration. I don't know why um, why that computer, that database is getting it, but their database isn't. It makes no sense. And it, it's not showing your name when you put in your thing. So I don't know if they're going to try to screw people over that way. Gotcha. They try to I'm here at the 2000... 21 Libertarian Party State Convention of Pennsylvania, and the credentialing committee is stepping outside of the bylaws. I was the chair of the Judicial Committee for several years here, so I have a very good grasp of the bylaws. What they've been doing, well, what the bylaws say is that you need to be a registered Libertarian unless prohibited by law. And if somebody, somebody is not in the state's database, it's called the SURE database, well, the SURE database is not reliable. If you're not in there, they're saying, well, you can't, you can't be a voting member. But in the bylaws, it says you just have to be a registered libertarian. In every convention, this is my 29th convention, every convention I've ever been to, if, there's, if that has been an issue, right on the spot, you fill out the voter registration form, or you go online, you hit the submit button, you see, I'm a registered libertarian. For some reason, well, I actually got the reason, uh, the guy who's running the credentialing, he said an arbitrary date of May 3rd that you had to be registered in the SURE database. Well, first of all, the SURE database is unsure. Yeah. And second of all, it's not in the bylaws to say by May 3rd. There's no cutoff date specified. So they're operating outside the bylaws. And the worst part is the guy who made that decision is running for vice chair. My name is Adam Reinhardt. I'm the chair of the membership committee and partially responsible for the debacle at credentialing this morning. <laughs> I, I thoroughly apologize for the dysfunction this morning. Uh, however, with the unusual size of our convention this year, it proved to be more challenging than anticipated. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, I apologize for my own shortcomings. But look around you right now. The reason for the debacle was that we have the most well-attended convention in the history of our state party. So give yourselves a hand. a candidate uh, running for Eastern Vice Chair was involved in the credentialing process and had the major say in all things that were happening with credentialing, that's that's really fishy to me. Um, you know, whether it was malfeasance or whether it was just an oversight, um, I would say that a person of true morals and principles would exclude themselves from, from being involved in that. 
just because of the conflict of interest. Order, order. Where you are bylaws, you have to be a registered libertarian unless prohibited by law in order to be a voting member. Uh, they have been, the credentialing committee has been turning away people who are registered libertarians. So the bylaw states that you have to be a paid, uh, dues-paying member of the LPPA. Correct. And that you have to be a registered libertarian. Correct. Okay. So people are signing up in front of the credentialing committee and providing proof that they are a registered libertarian. There's no details in there that says we have to use such, su such and such system. They are using the state website to show that they registered libertarian, and they're being turned away. You're turning away registered libertarians. And you register people to vote. This is the document that matters, not some clerk that puts your information into a computer. registered libertarian as of today. I appeal to the chair. And you're welcome to do so. Honestly, I, uh, when I gave my acceptance speech at the convention, I was so upset. Wasn't upset about losing. I was upset because for seven years I've been part of the Libertarian Party, and all I heard is, we need to bring new members in. We need to be inclusive. We need to grow this for seven years. The same people that were at that convention, that's all they talked about. And here we were with 140 new members that were told over and over again for, for six months, don't worry, we always waive the 180 day rule. We always waive the 180 day rule. Please show up. These are people that were candidates for office. They were elected libertarians. They were newly formed county chairs. These are people that for six months, the state party was bragging about their accomplishments and begging them to show up at the convention, insisting that they would be voting members. And then the day came and the establishment party saw that if we allow these members to vote, we're gonna lose control. We will not be the ones running the party. I'm pretty disappointed. Uh, kind of, it was kind of expected. Um, the 180 day rule, I was kind of half and half on um, whether that would really happen or not. So the rule itself is you, it's not your registration, it's your dues paid membership. You have to be a dues paying member for 180 days before you can vote in the convention or you can become a delegate or anything like that. And normally on something like this, you can't undo that, but there is a waiver right in the bylaw, the rule itself, saying that the members can, can waive this rule and allow the new members to vote. As far as uh, how long has that membership or that rule been waived, uh, the entire history of the state party is my understanding. Uh, my understanding, I, I could be wrong, but my understanding is it has never ever been waived and the, the state party has been around for like 40 years. The older guys that have been around 20, 30 years, this gets waived every year. There are a shit ton of out of state people that are voting members and they're going to vote to not allow this to happen. 
That's what they're here for, to stop the new people, which probably we brought in. Uh, to be able to so, vote. Dude, there's haters, there's haters from Mississippi, Illinois, uh, Michigan, New York, every hater in the country is here because I'm telling you, this is the Alamo. If we win here today, it's over for national, and they know it. Because of, some of a certain faction that has publicly stated, take over, take over, take over. And the people who have been in this party for a long time do not wish to just hand it over to those people that want to come and take over. There are more that are less than 180 days. That means they haven't even been to a meeting with the state board, let alone have any stake in this party. I do not get any people under 180 days. Let me speak. Shut the hell up. that I see come mostly from the left libertarians or sometimes even the libertarian socialists too. Um, like one, one guy was the former state chair, Drew Bingaman, um, just going off the hell and insults to, to the Meekhawks saying F you, you know, uh, former state chair, how professional is that? And he was chair of the judicial committee, uh, you know, last year. Um, the other one was Johnny Robinson. He's a libertarian socialist up in, I believe, Pike and Wayne County. Um, he's the chair up there. And, um, you know, he's always been a little bit involved, but he's always been kind of quiet and behind the scenes. But now that the libertarian socialists have been given more of a reign within the state party, uh, they're more accepted and, you know, embraced in the state party, which is very surprising to me. Um, they've been having a much louder voice. My name is Ross Goldberg. I've been in this party for 165 years. I also set up the chairs that you're sitting in and the tables that you're reading from. I paid for the shuttle for you to go back and forth to my restaurant yesterday, and I paid for a bunch of your meals. I've spent countless hours away from my family because I care about what we're doing. And all that I want to do is contribute with you and decide how we're going to keep spreading the message of liberty. And I would ask that you allow me to, to vote with you and, and waive the 180 day rule. There are an awful lot of people here who are not from Pennsylvania. Which one is worth more? Letting all these outsiders dictate who runs Pennsylvania or alienating the insiders? That's why I also say we should divide the question. Let's vote on the Pennsylvania people first, say let them in or not, and then secondarily, vote for the out-of-staters to let them in or not, just as we did in the 19, sorry, 2018 convention in Shippensburg. The other thing is, if you're not allowed to vote today, 
I would send them your receipt next to your dues back. The vote has always passed to allow new members to, to be able to vote at the state convention under the 180 day rule. Um, but it was always in the back of my mind. I said, hey, you know, this, this might very much happen because this is the only, op uh, only option left and that was the only lever left they had to pull. The rule, 72, no. Do not wait the rule. The rule is not Some of it is good people that, that have been fed lies. That are they, 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 a lot of it is people who have come into the party through the the Jorgensen campaign, uh, and they came in through people that they trust because those people are in positions of leadership in their county, or they were in positions of leadership at the state uh, for the state campaign for the president, and. Um, you know, on the surface, there's no reason not to trust them. And so they were brought in by these people and then told all kinds of awful things about us. You know, so there's this phenomenon where I've been in the party for six years and up until recently, most have a good relationship with almost everybody and don't really have too many people with bad things to say about me. And now we're, I, there's this phenomenon of like people who have been here seven, eight months uh, who were just absolutely positively assured that I am a transphobe. Uh, who have never talked to me. <laughs> so um, how could that possibly happen if they weren't told that, you know? And, and again, it's the same people who were saying Dave is a transphobe and he's divisive and we can't have him. So essentially what I think happened here is a very small number of people um, who are well positioned, who stand or stood to lose, um, went out of their way to poison the well and they did not care about what that did to like the intra-party dynamics and the relationships and the and and just the harmony of the party in doing so so long as they won i feel bad for the people that are in opposition of the caucus i feel like they're misinformed their hate is directed in in a in the wrong reason and i think they're scared to fight the real battle of freedom. They would rather spend more time fighting against a caucus that is trying to do good in the Libertarian Party because they have friends standing next to them saying, hey, yeah, this is good. You know, we, we hate the Mises Caucus too. But they're not going to their township meetings and standing up against corrupt politicians or bad laws. They're not talking to their chief of police or their state representatives or anything. They're fighting the battle while they're surrounded by what they think are their friends. And they're fighting the battle in a comfortable ground inside the Libertarian Party. So if, if you ask me what I should say to them, I think they should also grow some balls and take the fight to the people that want to infringe on our freedom and our liberty. Well, number one, I appreciate your perseverance, and it is our perseverance that's going to see us through this whole thing, and it's what has seen us through this whole process to this point. You know, because like I said, from the day one, we were being called Nazis. We were being called racist. But um, our perseverance through that, even when we lose, has now built something to where we are winning more than we are losing. So if we just keep that attitude and we, and we don't lose heart and we keep showing up and we keep talking to people, keep working with people, keep recruiting, keep the spirit of the Ron Paul revolution going, then uh, I think we're going to win out in the end. And I think when we win out in the end, we're going to win the narrative battle because the pattern so far has been in the states that we take over, uh, we do a very good job. The membership goes up, the revenue goes up, the amount of events going on goes up. So reasonable people see that and come our way. I am not going to beg them to let me speak. I am going to inform them that they will not shut me up. But I also think it's reasonable to request that people stop lying about us. That's all that I ask.
Stop lying about us and tell the truth. And then let's have an honest conversation about where our differences are, okay? So what I want to just say tonight, I want to just make it unambiguous and be very clear about who we are. So let me just state this for the record. This is who we are. We are the Ron Paul Army. That's who we are, okay? We are the Ron Paul Army and we are here to make the Libertarian Party a force. That is what we are here to do. You remember when Ron Paul would inspire all of those tens of thousands of young people to come out at every single event? Well, we're those people, okay? And this is our next chapter. What we represent is the Revolution 2.0. Thank <laughs> you.